There's an adage that says you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. If you've never heard that before, the basic premise is simple. If you don't try, you'll never have opportunities. And that's what was the underlying thought I had during this entire interview with Garvin Reed. Not only does Garvin take an opportunity, he's especially keen on leveraging it to help him find the next one. And so if I had to pick a theme for this episode, it's the power of building a network and being flexible so that you are ready for that opportunity whenever it shows up. Garvin is a career coach, photographer, and college administrator currently living in the UAE. He provides career advice to talented students at NYU Abu Dhabi and helps them land jobs and internships throughout the world. He's also a photographer and a content creator with Black Lovers Abroad, a travel blog he launched with his wife to showcase just that, Black couples traveling internationally. In this episode, Garvin shares how being laid off during an economic downturn and later on being fired from a job changed the course of his professional career. He discusses how key individuals within his circle proved to be pivotal in his eventual move to Abu Dhabi and how his own cross-cultural competency has adapted to a Middle Eastern context. And he definitely drops why he and his wife decided to put their own twist in that Black travel space. Garvin's story is definitely a ride, and I'm pretty sure you'll enjoy it. Welcome to the Global Chatter. So we are here with the latest episode of the Global Chatter. And from the intro, you know that my guest is Garvin Reed, who I am excited to have here as a fellow student affairs higher ed professional, but also someone who uh, has got some other interests that I think are pretty cool um, that we will get to when we kind of dive deep into this interview. So Garvin, welcome to the Global Chatter. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, I like to. So here's the thing. I like to do a temperature check with everyone. So where in the world are you currently located? Yes. So I am currently in, to be specific, um, Reem Island in Abu Dhabi (laughs) in the United Arab Emirates. See, I like I like good details. Like you set the scene, <laughs> and uh, can I can I tell you truly? I really like Abu Dhabi. Uh, I do. I and it's funny because I actually have not been to Dubai. My sister has, oh. but yeah, I know it's weird. Like, I, could I have gone? Sure, but Abu Dhabi is where I knew more people, and I really like Abu Dhabi. How long have you been out in the area? I love that. So I've been here for five years now. Um, I moved here, what, February of 2017. And I really like that that you said that because most people, they know of Dubai and yeah. they would do like a day trip to Abu Dhabi. And I'm like, ah, there's so much more to see in Abu Dhabi than just what you see on that um, very prescribed day trip <laughs> where they keep you on like a tourist <laughs> track and you do like nine out of the 10 things that most people who live there don't do. So yeah, I'm I'm pretty certain that you've seen a whole lot more of Abu Dhabi than um, the average person, which is great. I love that. Here's the here's the other thing, and I this even w- wasn't even where I was going to start, but I I think it's fascinating. So you because you live in a country where, you know, I think especially in the last couple of years, we've seen people be like, I want to go to Dubai, I want to go to Dubai, and and for good reason, right? There are yeah. things in Dubai that you don't see anywhere else, right? But you United Arab Emirates is a whole country. Yes. Yes. <laughs> do you know, yeah. Do you know so, what I mean? So there's and, yeah, there's there's like seven Emirates. Dubai is literally just one emirate. Yeah, there's so much more than just Dubai. And I it's I'm constantly like just like, you know, re educating folks. Like even like my family, oh, how is Dubai? I'm like, Dubai is great, Dubai. but I live in Abu Dhabi. Uh <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I have friends who live like it, of course, in other places like Alanen and, and whatnot. And and it's the same thing. People are like, how's Dubai? And they're like, I'm sure it's great. Right. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> near there. And then, and you know what? Let me tell you what's even funnier, right? Is that when you live in the region 
and okay, like I lived in Qatar, right? Mm -hmm. And people don't even know Qatar. Yep. 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 (laughs) Right. And they don't know Doha, which is where like 90% of the people live, right? Yep. (laughs) And I have to be like, okay, do you know where Dubai is? (laughs) Which is not even the (laughs) same country. Right. And they go, oh yeah, I know Dubai. I'm like, okay, so that's not the same country, (laughs) but that gives you some context that gets you at least a part of the map to start from. Yep. Oh oh my gosh. Yeah, no. So we're going to talk about how you got to to Abu Dhabi. So we kind of have to take it back. And Mm -hmm. so- where did you grow up? So I grew up in the Bronx. Okay, that's very specific. <laughs> New York for those for those true. of y'all who are not true, true, from true. the states. Yeah, true. <laughs> yes, the Bronx, which is in New York City. Um, it's one of the five boroughs. I mean, I'm going to be biased and say it's the best borough, but yes, the of Bronx, course, because <laughs> yes, of course. Bronx, New York. It's it's where hip hop started. Um, right. <laughs> I mean, there's there's like so much there's like so much so many good things about um the Bronx. But yeah, I'm um first generation American. My parents are Jamaican, nice. and I'm one of the first in the family that was born in the Bronx. And yeah, I I grew up in like the, the Northeast Bronx, to even be more specific. So mm-hmm. everyone's talking about, oh yeah, South Bronx, South Bronx. Um, that is part of the Bronx. Also, that's the part where hip hop started. I was I grew up in more so the Northeast Bronx. So I'm like five minutes away from like Westchester, which is like the suburbs mm-hmm. you can say. But yeah, that's that's my my home. Now did your parents come to the States as when they were like younger as children, or did they come maybe as young adults or even older than that from Jamaica? Yeah, they came as um young adults. So my dad, probably in his twenties, um mm-hmm. and my mom, I th- was she 30 yet? She, yeah, my mom was probably 30 by, by the time she came to the Bronx. Oh, they were grown, grown. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, they exactly. were. Yeah, there was, there was no mom to stay with. Nah, they were like, I'm going to come here and figure it out. Oh, wow. And, and you know what's funny is that I've had a number of Americans who are from New York City. And I just realized almost every American that I've had on here that's from New York that grew up in the city at least one parent came from the island yeah, or an island, right? Yeah. Like, and I, and I, and that's a common story, right? Cause you know, kind of growing up in the area, but now that I realize it, I'm like, everybody's like, yeah, mom came from Puerto Rico or dad mm-hmm. came from Jamaica or from, you know, St. Croix or <laughs> whatever. And so I wonder with, with your parents having those backgrounds and especially coming not even as children or teenagers, as adults, was there a lot of um, Jamaican influence maybe with, the, the folks you hung out with, the foods you ate, just in your life in general, did you sort of feel that? Yeah, I was actually just telling some friends this yesterday, matter of fact, that um, I feel like America was kind of like the place that I grew up, but my culture was very much Jamaican. So where I grew up mm. in the Northeast Bronx, for those of you who may or may not know, or anyone on like the East Coast definitely knows, but my mm-hmm. first job was Golden Crust. Um, so like I was which is like <laughs> yeah. golden crust is to Jamaican food what, yeah. what McDonald's is to burgers. So it's like right. yeah, like, like I was that much into the culture. I had like a like a reggae C D at one point back in high school. <laughs> like it was <laughs> okay. I was part of like a reggae dance crew. Um Oh God. Yeah, okay. and, oh listen, like I was I was into it into You were it. repping hard. All the way, <laughs> all the way. Like we had like a like a little DJ crew also. Oh cool. Only, only reason why I didn't go further with it was because I went away to college. But yeah, mm-hmm. no, like my my high school, you were either Jamaican, Nigerian, Ghanaian, mm. we had some Trinis, and maybe like a small number of like black Americans, and maybe like I think mm. there's like two white guys. But um, yeah, like right. Was, Everybody remembers them, right? Right. They were two. Right. <laughs> um, but you know, like the 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 culture where I grew up at, um, where I grew up at, was very much like Jamaican, and yeah, a lot of like Caribbean and even Africans um, in my area. And so, did you ever have a chance as a child? Um, or as a teenager to be able to go to Jamaica? Because I would assume, obviously, mm-hmm. you had extended family, right? Because yep. your your parents came as adults. So did you ever have a chance to go? And how regularly were you able to go? Yeah, mom used to send me down for summers, pretty much every summer until, I think, what? Maybe the sixth grade, fifth or sixth grade. The last time we went was actually when we moved to the neighborhood that I 
that I end up spending, I guess, most of my time in before I, I moved here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I was in Jamaica for the summer, came back and I was like, are we going home? And mom was like, yeah, we are going home. And I was like, you moved this whole summer and didn't even tell me. And she was like, <laughs> yeah. And I was like, okay. I mean, I couldn't say bye to my friends or anything like that. It was, I was kind of um, distraught, but yeah, I was, I was down there pretty much every summer. I was going to grandma's house um, where th there was no curfew because you can just run around barefoot. And it was, right. it was a vibe. Like <laughs> it was a great, a great time to grow up. And, and it also put things into, into perspective, right? Cause you got to right. see that, you know, we had two TV channels, but nobody was watching TV um, because we right. spent all day outside pretty much. Right. You know, it's funny you mentioned the TV channel. So like, I think at this point, everybody who ever listens to this podcast knows that I grew up in Cameroon. And yesterday I was on Twitter for whatever reason. And yeah. so it, it, this has nothing to do with even really talking about TV, but someone was making a comment was like, actually it was really random. They were trying to figure out if uh, Giannis, the basketball player was big in Nigeria uh. as he is like, you know, it, it, you know, the I can't say his last, name, but you know, the one yeah. who grew up in Greece or whatever. Yeah. And, and then, Cameroonians who couldn't help themselves hopped in the conversation was like, you know, Abib isn't really as big in Cameroon as he, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, but anyway, I know this, I, this is a long way of saying what I'm trying to say, but the reality is that they said, yeah, but if you think about it, like, you know, in Cameroon, we only have like one channel. And I'm like, it's 2022. We still only have one channel. We have one channel. <laughs> Unless you have a satellite, right? I was like, we still got only one right, channel, right. though. Like, yeah. Thank yeah. God for the internet, because that was not a thing when <laughs> I was a kid, but like, I was like, we still have one channel. So when you said, you know, Jamaica, they had two channels and yep. it's like the same. We yeah. had one when I was there and we didn't really watch TV like that. Yeah. yeah like, I mean, TV was like the last thing you were thinking about because we used to, we used to walk for miles and just like get into just like the most random mischief that you just can't right. get into in the States. Like we used to, we used to um, tie, I guess, strands of wheat a certain kind of way to catch lizards. And like we would like walk around and catch lizards. Like like that was an actual thing to do for the actual day, and that was it. Like man, we just caught some lizards. Man, yeah, we would be trying to get mangoes off a of mango tree. See, that yeah. was our thing. Like yep. just and and it was great, right? Because you could be hungry, and all you needed to rock, and you could hit some fruit. Boom, and it would fall. That's it. That's, Done. That's lunch. <laughs> Right. It's like a game, first of mm -hmm. all. So you're you're like you're doing something and then you get something to eat and then you're just chilling. And yeah, there there is something to be said about being in these. I And I say specifically these warm climates. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You, these cold climates don't have the same uh, vibe. If right. You will. Right. <laughs> right. That's facts. <laughs> So, so tell me about this. I mean, obviously you, you, you spent most of your time in New York growing up. Mm -hmm. Did you, even with going to Jamaica, right? Did your family travel even domestically or was it really restricted to kind of seeing the family in the old country or, you know, even just staying kind of in the tri-state area? Um, yeah, I got to say domestically, it was always around New York. So the so the tri-state area of course jersey because because we have family out there mm -hmm. um road trips to connecticut to like i think mystics mystic water park mm -hmm. or mystic sea park and then florida because we have family in florida but that was pretty much it mm -hmm. i can't i can't think of like anywhere else that we went if there was yeah um like i didn't see other states like that until probably college and i started like traveling on my own Mm. So let's talk about that. Where did you go to college? So I went to Cheney University in Pennsylvania, which is oh. America's oldest HBCU, first <laughs> HBCU, which I know is going to cause some ruckus for any folks who went to Lincoln or Wilberforce or other, whatever other <laughs> schools, but I'm going to put it out there. See you all day, Cheney University, 1837. You can't go wrong with that. Look. But, so, I, I don't think I've I don't think I've had anyone fight me yet. I'm trying to think who would be yeah, the people I've had on here, yeah, they couldn't even make that claim. I mean the last HBCU grad I had, where did she go? She went to HU. Camp. Okay. Well you know, she'll say the real HU. And then they got the whole the HU, way. HU beef. So yeah, they could right. They could have you're, you're right. I I try to keep these separate so that <laughs> so that so that people don't get all into it. But okay, what made what made you go down to Cheney? Was it because it was an HBCU? Was it because it was in PA? Was it just it had something you wanted? What was the what was the draw? Yeah, so in high school, I was I would say I was a little bit of a knucklehead. Like I knew my stuff, but I didn't really like apply myself that well. 
And one of my, I, I would definitely say like my college mentors for going to like choosing college was a cousin who went to Morehouse. Like this man was trying to brainwash me on, on, on Morehouse since, I don't know, like uh, middle school probably. But I just mm-hmm. couldn't wrap my head around the idea of hopping on an airplane to come home for like Thanksgiving and winter breaks and all of that stuff. Plus, I never even been to Atlanta. I, honestly, I still haven't been to Atlanta, but that's a whole different other story. Um, really? I know, I know, I know. You got to Florida? I know. You ain't even yeah. transit in Hartsfield? Nope. <laughs> it's like the busiest nope. airport nope. in the world. I, Literally, it just came out. <laughs> okay. I've probably only been to that airport once also, but like I said, whole other story. You need to get some Delta Sky Miles. That'll put you in that airport. Yeah. <laughs> But I did like the idea of, of um, going to an HBCU. So, and mm-hmm. I was a little bit lazy as a high school student. So I only <laughs> did the, I did the CUNY common application. And, and yeah. then I did, there was a, um, there was an HBCU common app that I highly recommend to everybody. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah. it's a great use of your resources and your time. I think it was like, I think 50 bucks and it goes to like 22 applications. I mean, or um, 22 colleges. Yeah. So I got into yeah. pretty much all of them. And then my brother and I, we did like a road trip and at the beginning of the road trip. So like based upon all of the booklets that I got, honestly, I really wanted to go to Lincoln because I was like, you know, they had like the coolest looking brochures. And on the way to Lincoln, we stopped at Cheney first because Cheney was closer than Lincoln. And I was like, Mm -hmm. I like it here. We can just we can just cancel the rest of the tour. I like it here. I'm going to I'm going to go to Cheney. And I was literally how I chose my school. (laughs) You know what? This is what I, in the back of my mind. I'm laughing because we're both higher ed professionals uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and it's really funny. <laughs> like yep. you think about what you, the reasons you chose stuff as a student right. versus being on the admin side where mm-hmm. you're like, what are you doing? That doesn't yeah. make that any makes sense. absolutely no sense. Why would you do that? But yeah, that, that was me. Yeah. And, and <laughs> for my, for my own understanding, where in PA is Cheney exactly located? So to be specific, um, southeastern Pennsylvania. So we're about, what, 15 minutes away from Delaware. So we're closer to okay. Delaware than we are to Philadelphia, but we're on like that side of Pennsylvania. Gotcha. And the reason I, the, I asked this is that obviously, you know, given the setup that you discussed about growing up in New York City, growing up in a very multicultural space, right? Very like immigrant diverse space. I'm curious going to college and this was the case for some people so i don't know if it was for you was it a cultural shift going to college in pennsylvania 110 <laughs> <Yeah>. percent <Okay. laughs> especially okay. especially going to cheney um so what i found out later on about lincoln versus cheney because so most of my fraternity brothers um actually so i ended up pledging alpha and mm-hmm. my fraternity brothers who went to lincoln the majority of them were from New York. Like Lincoln was literally little New York. I would probably say little Brooklyn wow. in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Versus Cheney yeah. was all the way Pennsylvania. Um, so <laughs> I had no ex- no experience of the Philly slang of Johns and Ball. And like, um, I honestly didn't know a lot about like the black Muslims until I went to Cheney. Um, yeah. like that, like the Philly style of rocking like the dicky suits. It's, it was yeah. it, like, it was, I had more of a cultural shock going to Cheney probably than I had coming to Abu Dhabi. <laughs> yeah. No, I can believe it yeah. because I, I would probably say this ad nauseum on this podcast, probably in every episode, whenever I have Americans on here, I'm like, yeah, this country's big. Yeah. So we, <laughs> From state to state's different. Mm-hmm. And then black people, black people are different, yep. right? Yep. <laughs> and so you get used to the black people you know. Mm-hmm. And then you meet black people who are doing stuff different. And you're like, I didn't even know that was an option. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's how I that's how I feel. What did you uh and while you were there, what did you choose to study? So I ended up studying um business management and it took me what like two and a half years to even pick a major because I liked everything. Um right. and I liked everything until it got to a point where math crept in and I was like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't, I don't like it that much now. <laughs> um, me and, and math are not the greatest of friends. So, um, but I was able to, I think because the math that, that we had in most of the business major classes were easy to apply to real life. And it kind of like made sense yes. that I was able to like tough it out yes. for that. But um, yeah, like at first I was looking at bio. I was looking at- That's uh, that math. That's exactly math. that math was a different kind of math i was like wait it's like what? calculus and stuff right yeah, yeah it, it just it just got to a whole other area um 
computer science also. And then I was like, yeah, nope, this oh, doesn't make sense either. Right. <laughs> okay. yeah, I was, I was like, like uh, yeah. I was like, I'll just keep this as like a hobby. And then, yeah, business was, was the area that made the most sense for me. So that's what I ended up choosing. So my, my undergrad major was business management. So did you have an idea of what you were going to do? Because you are in higher education right mm-hmm. now. So what did you think you were going to do with that degree? And, I, you know, working with students, I definitely know where folks are like, when I'm unsure, you know, or if I'm unsure, at least with a business degree, I can figure it out. But did you, what were you thinking when you were graduating that you were going to do professionally? That was 100% my, my plan also. I had no clue, but I was like a business degree. <laughs> I, I can apply it to something and just forward movement is better than stagnant movement. And I was like, that's what I'm going to just end up doing. Um, I was, I was hoping for finding like a rotational program of some sorts and just hoping mm-hmm. that one of the rotations would stick. Um, I had, I had internships almost every summer also. And, um, like that kind of helped some, well, it helped to eliminate what I didn't want to do. So that right. helped there. I, well, I, I, I can definitely say by my, by my junior year, I was really gung ho on doing Peace Corps. Um, cause I, okay. cause I found out about that through going to the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, um, yeah. conference. And I was like, oh, this seems amazing. Like I can do, I can spend two more years still trying to figure out what it is, what it is I want to do, <laughs> but in the midst right. of it, kind of give back. And I was like, oh, and I can do this in a, in a, in a country where I would, you know, be amongst my peoples. Cause I, I really wanted to end up doing it in sub-Saharan Africa and everything mm-hmm. was slated for that. But then at the last minute they were like, oh, um, I have something called, uh, I guess G6 PD, which means I have low iron. So mm-hmm. if I were to take malaria, anti-malaria pills, I would have gotten anemia. And if I didn't take it, I would have, mm-hmm. gotten, I would have gotten malaria. So malaria. Yeah. yeah. So then um, at like the last minute, they were like, oh, we're going to switch it so that you go to Tonga. And I was like, I have no clue where Tonga is at. I was like, where's Tonga? Where? Tonga? I was like, look, yeah. Look, <laughs> I asked what random story about Tonga. I've never been to Tonga either. Y'all, it's in the Pacific. Anyway. I, it's exactly. I, yeah. <laughs> I know now. I... Right. I Someone has said, I was talking about something and I said, blah, 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 Togo. And I was talking about Togo, the West African country. And they're like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, Tonga. I'm like, Tonga and Togo <laughs> are so not next to each other. Trust me. And so, yeah, but Tonga is not a place a lot of people know. And so did you, I, I'm assuming you did not go. Correct. Did I go? did it. So I didn't <laughs> go because at that point I had, I had an internship. Well, I already graduated by then. I had an internship with Black Enterprise. I started my, I was, I was, I was living that, oh, nice. you know, freshly graduated New York City life, going to happy hours, all that stuff. And I, and I thought I was doing something. Nice. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. I thought, you know, yeah. I was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to just turn down Peace Corps. Life is, life is good. Um, <laughs> mind you, this was in 2008. Um, ah! Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> then sorry. Bear Stearns crashed. Lehman crashed. Yeah. Black Enterprise yeah. ad sales starts to like dry up. Right. And it was like, oh, that internship to full-time offer that, that we had for you. Yeah. We're actually going to have to lay you off. I was like, dang. Oh my God. And I was like, dear Peace right. Corps, I was just playing. <laughs> and it was like, nah, bro. So I just had to figure it out. <laughs> so, I'm, not, I'm so sorry. To, it, look. Yeah. It worked out though in the long run. <laughs> no, it did, but dang, like, yeah. you know, I, I tell folks, people have to understand, I think if you are younger Gen X, older millennial, uh, or mid millennial, you either got hit with, if you're around my age, you got hit with September 11th on 2001, mm-hmm. which triggered a recession, mm-hmm. or you got hit again with the recession. <laughs> seven years later Mm -hmm. in 2008. And so, oh my gosh, I guess I'm trying to think in my mind, I can definitely see how sweet the spot was when everything was going right. Like you're in New York City, you're working for a black magazine. You know what I'm saying? It's business. Like that's the dream for, I mean- I'm wearing my suit and, and tie on the subway, like, you know. Yes. Yeah. Like that's the dream, especially as a business major. And right. so- what what did you decide what like what what did you decide to do like what was the pivot that you had to do at that point because you definitely your plans fell apart so then yeah. what so that's where a lot of my career development skill sets actually um got got sharpened so a lot of the things i learned from the Thurgood Marshall College funds from their like uh conferences about like networking and using your resources and all that stuff 
I pretty much was doing a whole lot of that. So after I got laid off from Black Enterprise, I had a temp job doing data entry at the Avon Foundation, which literally, Mm -hmm. if you ever saw the movie Office Space, that was exactly what that job (laughs) felt like. Like to a T, it was just not the kind of job for me. But I was just networking throughout the whole time in doing that. And then through a contact that I had, I think I was I was still in the, in the Thurgood Marshall College Fund's talent pool. And they must have had some kind of collaboration with Chubb Insurance. And Chubb, uh-huh. I guess Chubb really wanted to increase diversity. Um, and mm-hmm. I can see why after I got there. So I took a job <laughs> to, be a, to be an insurance underwriter with Chubb Insurance Company in White House Station, New Jersey, where I was one yeah. of maybe 60 or 70 underwriters. And I was probably one of two Black people out of 70 people. Um, <laughs> but at that point, in, Jer- in Jersey, in New Jersey at that. And like, <laughs> not like, not like Trenton, not no, not even like, you know, like right across the bridge, Jersey. So not like T-neck or like close to New York. It was an hour and a half commute. I had more coworkers from Pennsylvania than New, like New York City. Uh, but I was like, I'm not going to be moving to Jersey for this job. Cause I was like, I, I just, I just felt like it wasn't permanent. Um, but I, I learned some great skills as there that I will say I still use till this day. Um, pretty much my job was to assess risk to make sure that they don't, or to make sure that the company can be profitable. So what that job taught yeah. me was to ask the right questions before going to management or always ask the right questions before making a decision, um, which that was a life skill that pays dividends, um, to this day. So that job lasted for like a year and six months because I got to say I wasn't the greatest at it. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. And I mean, I also wasn't passionate about it either. So it, right. it, it lasted for one year and six months. And I think it was, yeah, through another fraternity brother um, via my grad chapter who was on the, I guess, the um, dissertation board for one of his students who was a uh, um, she was a senior official at Monroe College in the Bronx, and she was writing her dissertation on the trajectory of black men post graduation from undergrad. Yeah. So, so she was looking for, for, um, black men to interview. I was one of the people who she interviewed and we really just hit it off. I was like, you know, sure. Like, I, I think she was like offering to interview folks for like some free pizza. And I was like, you know what? It's free pizza, but it's also a conversation <laughs> with, with um, someone in the industry that I'm considering getting into. So I'm like, it's a win win for me. So. Yeah. I did the interview and she was like, you really should consider working for Monroe College. I was like, oh, that's great. Are you guys hiring? She says, no. Um, and I said, like, okay. <laughs> but I always kept her like, you know, I, I just, I, I just always checked in every, I think I had it set for like every 60 days. So every like two months, I would just say, Hey, you know, just so I'm checking in, hope all is well. Um, here's the latest that I'm doing here. And then I think after I actually got fired from Chubb, I was like, Hey, just checking in. Hope all is well. Um, I'm actually in the market for an opportunity now. I had to like make it look good, right? Um, yeah. And then she <laughs> right. actually replied to me like that same day saying, funny enough, we're actually opening up some roles for, I forgot what they called it, but it was like a fancy word for like an admissions counselor. But it was like, yeah. it was like a training so that it wasn't just coming to do admissions. It was like, we're going to yeah. build this whole program around you as an admissions counselor at Monroe College. And, um, yeah, like for what it's worth after getting fired from the job in Jersey, I had probably one of my best summers since high school because I was getting paid (laughs) via unemployment. And then I started the job with Monroe college. And that's when I was like, yo, student affairs specifically, like, well, what certain kind of jobs I get, this is, this is what it is for me. Like I'm loving this. It was probably the first job I had that I thoroughly enjoyed. Like I would say 90% of what I, what I, I did, which was great. All right. So if you're joining us from after the break, uh, you know that Garvin really took us to story and how he got into higher ed. He is a higher ed professional currently. That is a big reason why he's in Abu Dhabi. And so, uh, Garvin, I'm really curious. So 
you worked at Monroe College. You eventually would work at NYU, which NYU, right? I feel like it's self-explanatory, but yeah, New York definitely. University that's in <laughs> New York, although New York. there are branch campuses, which some people know. So how did you get over to NYU? And more importantly, how did you take that opportunity to get abroad? Yes. So this is a very important question. I got to NYU New York because when I was at Monroe College, like I said, I really enjoyed my job. I was working in admissions. The population of students I work with, honestly, were a lot like the kind of high school student I was when I was in high school. And although I will say this, Monroe is a for-profit college, but it wasn't like sharky, like, you know, the ones you see when you're watching like Maury. Um, oh my it wasn't God. like that kind of right. So by, by the way, Maury, right? by the way, Maury is ending this season. It is right. Like I, what, what I know that's not you? important yeah. to this. But <laughs> I think probably Maury's like eighty something years old. You can only say you're not the father. Only so many. I guess. Times. Anyway, I, I, I guess. digress. <laughs> Right. Anyway, yeah. So, um, yeah, like I was, I was, I was doing great work, um, and I was, uh, affording people the opportunity to start their higher education journey, right? So whether it be the associate's program, bachelor program, or even like for masters as well. But I didn't have a masters, and I think everyone else on the admissions team had a masters. So my supervisor, who was a director of, of admissions, um, he was like, "Listen, you have to get a masters," and I was like. Okay. Um, I still had aspirations to, to live and work abroad. So I was looking at just two programs. It was Columbia Teachers College and mm -hmm. then the higher education and student affairs program at NYU. And mm -hmm. the, the program at NYU was the one that had, they talked about like, um, being a global student and they even had like a study abroad portion in there versus mm -hmm. Columbia's teacher college was all about like administration and, yeah. It didn't, I don't know, it, it, did, it didn't really resonate with me. So I was like, okay, boom, I'm going to go with NYU. Um, I get to NYU and it's very expensive <laughs> um, uh, to the to the tune of, I think two courses cost me, I think $11,000. And I was like, right. this, this is no right. joke. <laughs> um, right. So through more networking, which is definitely a theme of my career, there was a alum from Cheney who worked in HR at NYU SPS, which is the School of, of uh, Professional Studies. And he was like, yo, bro, um, I've been like following you for a while now because I was very involved in, in Cheney things. So I would I would always like volunteer to yeah. do the career fairs on behalf of Cheney in um, New York. So if they couldn't find someone or admissions couldn't make it to New York, I would always like volunteer to do the career fairs and uh, the um, college fairs and I would speak on panels on like why you should go to HBCU or the importance of going to college for like the urban league and all that stuff. And he was like, yeah, um, we have a role at NYU that you should consider. And I was like, uh, I really love my job at Monroe. I'm in the Bronx. I'm working with like a population that I really enjoy. I'm giving back. He was like, oh, did I mention that they also have a 90% discount on tuition? I was and like, well, in like, that case. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Right. I'll I see you like, on the other side. <laughs> and I was like, here's my here's my resume. Um <laughs> I wrote this cover letter also. And yeah, so fast forward, um, my I got my first job at NYU New York as an academic advisor. I had a amazing director there who's probably like like one of my mentors till this day. We don't talk as much, but I need to I need to definitely reach out to her more. And yeah, within one year, my tuition bill went from I think um, eleven thousand dollars for two classes to like eight hundred per course, which I was like, See. that's doable. <laughs> yeah, See. yeah. I was like, that's very much doable. That's and then how you make after, moves. exactly right, right. So then after more networking, um, one of my advisees in that in the because I was the academic advisor for the HR program, which is human resource human resources um ma uh, master's program. And one of my advisees happened to be a associate director in the career center at NYU SPS. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, I want to know more about the work that you all do, because I just really I never really worked in career services, but I was always the one helping my friends with their resume. And like pretty much everything that I learned from both the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. Um, I also had this internship uh, with um, the Washington the Washington Center in DC, which had like a lot of like professional development. I also went through the I forgot what they're called. I think they call like professional development sourcing rounds with inroads. Um, yeah. And I just really soaked up all of that stuff, and I kept on using it over and over in my career. So my so my resume literally went through 
the Washington Center, Thurgood Marshall, and Inroads. Um, and I just used that, that knowledge to help all of my friends build their inter, I mean, build their resumes and all of those networking skills, all of those things that I learned, I kept on passing along. And I was like, I really want to get into career services. I feel like I can, you know, I would like this as well as academic advising is it's cool, but it's not fun. Um, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> right. not, right. not my, not my cup of um, tea. So I networked with her and she was like, oh, lo and behold, we actually have a role coming up. And then I went through interview rounds and I got that round and I got that job within the career services, which I really, really loved doing. And I was doing that for about two years, about two and a half years. And then I was getting to the point where um, there was a promotional opportunity still within NYU, NYU, New York, but in like the main career center. Mm -hmm. um, and, but there was also I, I also still had this goal of wanting to live and work abroad. So I was like, before I even considered that, um, I reached out to my networks, um, actually at that same person's wedding and, and they was like, oh, um, some, some other folks from the main center of New York was like, oh, we actually know the director of NYU Abu Dhabi's career center. And I was like, that's dope. So then I sent them my resume and then they sent it over to, um, Hazel at NYU Abu Dhabi. And then. Yeah, that was like a six round interview process and it took like a while. But yeah, five years, well, not five years later, but like five years ago, I landed yeah. here and it's been amazing. So long story, but the weaving part is honestly all about networking. Like I would not be here had it not been for those sisters who look out for me throughout that process. And let me ask you this question, because obviously what started you on your trajectory to NYU partially was to get that master's. Had, yeah. you, had you completed the master's before you went? Actually, right at that, I think, so I got the job November of 2016, and I was going to be starting in January, and I completed my master's that same fall semester in November. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah, no, and I and I appreciate you kind of sharing your story because one of the things when, you know, on the Black Expat main site is that I try to show, you know, my writers different ways that people get abroad as Black folks. And I love the fact that you, you actually do something that I always tell kind of people to do in the corporate space as well, is to find if your company has opportunities abroad, right? Yep. Sometimes that's the easy, you know what I mean? It's easier than just yeah. looking for a new job. And I yep. don't think we talk about it as much in, in international education, but it's certainly, I mean, that's how I got to VCU. I was at VCU doing something else. Mm -hmm. And then there's VC <laughs> Tucker, right? So like, yeah. so, yeah. so, but we, and, and it's easier sometimes when people are like working for like Coca-Cola, right? And they're like, oh, there's Coca-Cola Germany or whatever. But like as an educator and so in student affairs, we don't talk enough about how that networking in that way can take you abroad. And so one of the questions that I know I, that I've been asked and, and I'm sure, you know, you might get asked is having worked in career services and, and done your job in the States, how does it differ, you know, especially with you being in higher ed, working in the Middle East and working in the Gulf? My attentiveness, my attuneness, is that a word? Attuneness, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, no, that's a word. Yeah, and my sensitivity to culture is just heightened beyond like any seminar in the States or anything like that. Like, like yes, I've, I've gone through the seminars um, and the trainings when I was at NYU New York and they were great. But you're actually putting it into practice every single day here at NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, like I'm talking to students and I can't, I can't rest on the, on the simple fact that, you know, in NYU New York, maybe 80% of the students that I was talking to, they were probably from the U S and they can get jobs in the U S right. Right. Or, or they had access to either like OPT and CPT and all of those things, which can allow them to stay in the country for maybe up to like two more years post-graduation. Right. Um, here, like, like passport privilege is a real thing. And I'm like, I was, I was learning, learning about passport privilege at the same time where I'm helping students navigate their careers where I'm now realizing that there is a, there is a thing called passport privilege where I can't just say, oh, well, you know, yeah, you, you can work for Deloitte in New York. Like, no, you actually can't because it's highly right. difficult to get, you know, um, sponsored to be in the U.S. Or depending on what country you're from, you probably can't go to London or you probably can't go to what like uh, Europe or Spain. Like, yeah. So it's just you really have like a like like a heightened sense of cultural awareness for one. Mm -hmm. And then. I will say one of the other big differences too be, uh, with um, being out here 
like, yes, I'm still working for NYU, but NYU Abu Dhabi, and I guess it's definitely because of the culture of the UAE, but um, the culture of the country rules more than the culture of the company. Uh, yeah. Like, for instance, right now is Ramadan. So I've been home since, well, today I work from home, but today I only work three hours because it's Ramadan. Mm-hmm. And I think, what, in two weeks, we're going to have the Eid break. So the mm-hmm. Eid break is going to be hopefully, hopefully knock on something. It'll be at least um, five, five business days off. Right. Um, there is no, oh, well, NYU New York isn't off. So you have to be on. No, there's none of that. Like we're off. NYU right. New York, got to figure it out, but we're off. So yeah, like just seeing that, seeing that the world doesn't revolve around American culture. That's been eye opening for me for sure. Yeah. I mean, let me put it this way. I think also for me, a mind shifted. Oh, we're working Sunday to Thursday. Oh, yes, that too. Right? Yeah. Which seems like such a small shift. But when you come from a world where it's Monday through Friday, and, and we're saying mm-hmm. officially Monday through Friday, we know people also overwork themselves. But like right, right. <laughs> Sunday through Thursday. And then, and then the, my favorite part is, okay, you're working on Sunday, but you need something from somebody in the States. Oh, yes. You know good and well they're, they're, they're not going to read it on Sunday. By the time no. they read it on Monday with time difference, really, it's Tuesday. And I don't yeah. and I don't know how y'all operate, but like, you know, Thursday is Friday. <laughs> and, yeah. by, and by like, I want to put nobody on blast, but like, let's just say by midday. Yeah, I'm being nice <laughs> on a Thursday. Yeah. Things are already <laughs> they, right. They're slow. Yeah. They're slow. yeah. I mean, they really probably slowed around, slowed down around 9 a.m. on Thursday. But like, mm-hmm. there's no, ain't nothing happening on Thursday. Really. No, not at all. Not seriously. Well, so, <laughs> um, we actually just switched back to now Monday to Friday as of January. Really? Yeah. So, so um, the country switched on January 1st and NYU made the switch uh at the beginning of the spring semester so i think like january 23rd wow so yeah yeah so so now we're, we're doing monday to friday um like UAE, that was like a big yeah UAE the entire is on UAE. Monday to Fri- really yep yep I'm, yep I'm, because i'm wondering just from a reli- like okay <laughs> oh yeah yeah so i'll say that right so now our Fridays look like this. We have a big i think it's a two and a half hour gap in our schedule where you do not schedule meetings. Like you don't schedule meetings right. and people are not expected to work because that is like the peak time for you to go to the mosque for prayer. Right. So even if you're not practicing, if you're not a Muslim, um, you just don't schedule meetings and you just enjoy that two and a half hour break. So you can take a longer lunch break. You can relax. You can do whatever you want, but yeah, you're expected for two and a half hours and just not do anything. Hmm. But wow. yeah, yeah, we are back to Monday. To, we are on Monday to Friday now. And I know, and I know that, I would imagine most of it has to do kind of with quote unquote the global economy and Definitely. just I, business and whatnot. But all, part of me is mm-hmm. like, but why you, <laughs> this is me being the West? Why you got to cater to the West? <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right, right. Like, honestly, can we just get stuffed up between Tuesday and Thursday and call it a day? That's just right. me. <laughs> but, <laughs> or Monday through Wednesday, but whatever. And so, mm-hmm. Even with all of that, I know that, you know, with your job and, and what you do, you also are a photographer. Is that yes. correct? Is mm-hmm. that something that you have always been doing or is that something you picked up while you were abroad? I would say closer to always been doing. It was a side hustle that I picked up probably when I was in, in undergrad. It was, uh, what, four of my friends and I, yeah, we, we formed like a photography collective of some sorts in undergrad. Mm. And, um, we took photos at all the frat parties. So we got it for free. Um, we took photos <laughs> at course. homecoming. So honestly, it was, it was a means to get into parties for free. And, <laughs> and it also was a means for us to get our cell phone bills paid because it wasn't making that much money, but it made just <laughs> enough to make sure our cell phone bill was paid. So that was, that was always good. And then, um, yeah, towards, I think, our senior year is when we got the second contract to take photos for graduation, which was actually like a pretty big deal. Yeah. Uh, and then and then we kind of kept it going after graduation. But like I went back to New York, so I wasn't as involved. But like we actually had people who were on campus who were taking photos like like for us, um, I think maybe for like one or two years after we graduated. But then I was back in New York and I kind of picked it back up on my own. I bought myself a camera. And, um, I had some friends who were working in like promotions at clubs. 
So I was like, yo, let me just come shoot at your at your um party for free or, or like <laughs> 30 bucks an hour. And yeah. that's how I that's how I really got started like taking it to like a whole other level in um New York. And when I moved out here, I was like, I still have this great skill set. And I mean, I have this yeah. network. So I just honestly like most of my photography clients now really all come through my like word of mouth and my, nice. my network. So it's mostly yeah. the black the um black expats who are out here. Coworkers mm-hmm. from NYU Abu Dhabi, and then word of mouth through just being passed down through like the travel groups. Um, whenever someone says, "Hey, I'm going to Abu Dhabi," or I'm, "I'm going to the UAE and I'm looking for a, a, um, a photographer," most times I'm the person that they end up tagging. <laughs> and yeah, we have a great time and do some great shoots in the desert. And of yeah. course, because <laughs> there's a lot yeah. of desert, right? Like lots and, I, and lots, lots of desert. I have seen your work and I, I think you do such great work. And I mean, I, I it totally makes sense, right? Because it, especially if you don't live in the area and you're like, I'm on this trip and I want to document it. I mean, getting someone who you could communicate with and I'm sure obviously you being American and being English speaking and I'm sure there's a good number of Western clients as, as well as others. It probably mm-hmm. makes it easier because I, you know, if I were to go somewhere and it's like, I'm looking for a certain aesthetic Sometimes yeah. it's hard to explain that when you don't yes. speak the same language. But I think having you and having you be somewhere that you know the area, I can definitely yeah. see why your networks would be yep. booming in that. Yeah. And so, which allows me to kind of pivot in this new project but, but, that you've got going on. But before we get to that project, so I, I, I don't know if I was doing my research and realized up until this point, we have not mentioned your wife. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who... For what I'm understanding, you met her while you've been living out in Abu Dhabi, correct? Yes. Yes. So we met on Tinder, which everyone's like, oh my gosh, like Tinder actually works. I was like, yes, it actually does work. <laughs> it works for some people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 We're actually one of the, the rare success stories. So yeah, we met on Tinder at, back in 2017. Mm-hmm. And we've pretty much been like inseparable since and COVID really made us inseparable because <laughs> like during the whole lockdown, she was in the midst of finding a apartment for her new job in Dubai. Um, but mm-hmm. then COVID hit and it was like um, she couldn't even go to Dubai because the lockdown here literally meant you could not leave Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we were just living together and then it was like, hey, let's actually just like actually live together in real life. And then that went well <laughs> and then I proposed and then. Here we are. We've been married since December 24th of last year. So what brought her to the area? So was she already working in the area before you got there or was, did she come afterwards? Like what brought her yeah. to the country? Yeah, she was already working here. So she's, I think she has about six to eight months ahead of me here. And so, so she's a, she's a BCPA, so board certified behavior analyst. And cool. she was working for a company that's based out of Boston. Um, mm-hmm. but they have a branch out here. So a similar, similar setup to NYU, right? Yeah. And that's what brought her to, to Abu Dhabi. And then she, she actually left them, I think back in 2018 or so. Um, and then she's worked for like a number of other centers doing, doing similar work. And, but as of, I think last year, she started her own business. Um, and now she freelances and does that. And then she also went to India to become certified in yoga. So she's also mm-hmm. does yoga instructing and she does, she actually does that at um, NYU part time as well, too. So just hustling and, and make it yeah. happen. Oh my gosh, that's super cool. Cause it sounds like she mm-hmm. integrated. You said she's a behavioral analyst. So I'm thinking of a counseling yep. background. That's where we're going yep, with that. Definitely. Yep, yeah. Yep. I think and, uh, undergrad was in undergrad with psychology. Yeah. Undergrad was. Yeah psychology um masters um i forget but in that same realm <laughs> yeah no that makes absolute sense oh my gosh i might have to bring her on the podcast to talk a little bit about definitely it. yeah she'll be a, a great guest <laughs> this, have it's really funny i do these interviews in the middle of it someone's like okay you should bring someone on to this podcast and i'm like you know we're recording right so everyone so everyone's just heard that now i gotta invite this person but i think i want to bring yeah. her on <laughs> um and so but together you guys started or launched something called black lovers abroad i'm yes. curious to find out what is the story behind that and, and what kind of made you guys want to go in that direction with that project yeah so one of the main things that we watch together um is youtube because well cable yeah. out here that they have cable out here but it's just a little different um uh-huh. there's, there's not a lot of english channels so like we spend a lot of time on youtube and then also 
most people's t- like within their top three majority of reasons for coming to the UAE, um, travel is always within people's top three. So yeah. for us, um, that was my number two. And I think for Melody, that was like her number one. Um, yeah. so we spent a lot of time watching like travel, travel vlogs on YouTube and we used that to build the itinerary for some of our like most like best trips ever. Mm-hmm. So like when we like prior to going to Sri Lanka, we did that prior to going to Goa in India, we did that also. And we noticed that a lot of these travel vlogs that we're watching are not from black people. Right. And then also the travel, the, the travel blogs that we're reading also are not from black people. And we're like, right. I feel like there's an area. Cause like, I, I know for a fact that we do travel and I know that we go to these places. Like, um, so like, I was like, huh, there's, there's definitely room for us to have our voice in this as black travelers. So, um, we actually began it during our trip to Georgia, the country in January. And it was just great to just write about how, how it is to be a black person in Georgia, which I think is important because most people think about, you know, Georgia is in, it's in, it's in Eastern Europe. Um, it's a, it's in the Caucasus mountains, like Caucasus mountains, like Caucasians. Mm-hmm. Yes. Caucasians. Yes. And Caucasians. Like, That's right. Well, I'm going to be a, <laughs> right. So, so you're like, so you want me as a black person to go to Caucasus mountains? I ain't going to out the there. To the heart man. of it. Right. 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 <laughs> but, but lo and lo and behold, as you'll read from the um blog, like they're mad chill. Like, like I don't know why or where the word Caucasian came to talk about black, well, white folks in America, but these some these some some different white folks for sure. And yeah, like so honestly, that's that's an angle that we go from in writing our um blog. So Melody is doing an amazing job on our Instagram page. So yeah. like she's putting reels up at least what once a week. And um, whether it's about, you know, traveling abroad or even about some of the local things happening here in the UAE. Like, for instance, um, most folks say, oh, don't go to the UAE during Ramadan because everything's closed. One, that's changed a whole lot. And then two, um, it's actually when you are closest to the culture, because oftentimes right. in travel in travel uh, groups, I see people say, oh, you go to the UAE, but you never really get to interact with the Emirati. During Ramadan, it's much easier to, for one, and then two, like you're you're actually seeing the culture, right? So you're not you're not you're not here thinking that oh, it's just Vegas in the Middle East. Like you're right. you're seeing people actually outside during the, during a the call to prayer, and you're seeing iftar happening outside, and it's just a whole different vibe. So th- that's the kind of angle that we go on for our blog and our Instagram and things like that. We've thought about doing like a vlog, like for videos, but. To be honest with you, video editing stresses me out. <laughs> so, yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure about that one. I mean, you know what you can do if you aren't already doing it. Do TikToks. Mm, true. Do TikToks because it's true. so much shorter. Mm-hmm. And and first of all, TikTok now has become the most used website in the world. Like it surpassed Google, which is true. insane because we yeah, go on Google yeah. for research everything. But last yeah. year, TikTok. And and I know pandemic was part of it, but yeah. I know I spend, you know, them them little 30 second minute, they have added it, right? Minute videos add up. All of a sudden you spent two hours yeah. on TikTok. But I will say some of the people I really enjoy are the folks who just give a little impeach, like if they're traveling or, mm-hmm. you know, they want to talk about an experience, they just give a little peek. And, mm-hmm. and I think it's less editing than what you'd have to do, right? Because it's, it's short. And you could just throw the voiceover later, right? So you just, you've got your, yeah, I think so. But, and it's, uh, yes, it is a lot of work to do video editing and not to make this a a content creation thing. But if you ever create content, (laughs) (laughs) I, I need whole podcast episodes on how much work it is to create content for the little, little two minute or 15 minutes that people see, hear, or read. I'm like, that took like five days, you know, just to get that two minutes. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Do it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. But more importantly, I think that with what you guys are doing, you are filling a void because you're right. Black, tra- well, black travel has exploded in the last couple of years, right? In terms of us seeing it in certain spaces. But now what I, what I'm enjoying is seeing different nuanced black travel. So yeah. now, now it's no longer just black travel, but we're seeing you know, solo travel, obviously female travel. We're seeing 
family travel. I don't know if I see a whole lot. This is just me and I could be wrong. And this is why I kind of think you stand out in my mind. I don't know if we see a whole lot of just straight couple travel. And I don't know, mm-hmm. yet, like, you know, without kids, right? <laughs> or right. in your case, at least with the, the places you've mentioned, kind of places where people don't think to go. Like, I promise you, I as much as I've been out in these streets, I have not seen somebody do something on Georgia. <laughs> so like that already sticks yeah, out in my yeah. mind, like with your travel, right? Like mm-hmm. you really have the, the potential to go to places and tell stories where, you know, you could do something on Poland. Ain't nobody been to Poland, right? Like that's not right, that's not yeah. the place that comes up. Bali comes up, Dubai comes up. Right. People ain't like, right. you know, let me tell you about Warsaw. <laughs> you know? Right. Like, I would love to <laughs> right, <do that>. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, what is your hope with this project down the road? Like, what do you hope it becomes? Um, that's a good question. I think like our our goals are small for now. So the goal is, uh, I mean, one is, 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 is to write and post consistently, which, uh, that's just been a difficult one with having a, a full-time job. Um, yeah. but yeah, just like starting out where like we can get at least one thing sponsored because of this blog. Right. And then just, yeah. just have it just build more and more and more from there. Um, yeah. but yeah, I think, yeah, the goals are just starting out small and long term. Hmm. Honestly. I think if we can get to a place that we never imagined we would be at because of this blog, that would be amazing. So whatever that may be, I would love and I would love to put that into the universe and accept that happening. You've just listened to an episode of The Global Chatter, which is hosted by me, Amanda Bates. It is edited by Stephanie Ficcio. Don't forget to subscribe to The Global Chatter on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us on Instagram at the global chatter or stop by Twitter and find us at global chat pod. If you have a question, want to subscribe to the newsletter or are interested in sponsoring, visit the global chatter.com.